Let me ask you, how many of you have ever had the experience where you're driving in your car and you just ran out of gas? And if you've had that experience, uh, I want you to be honest. Did you realize you were running low on gas before you actually ran out, or did it come to you as a total surprise, a total shock? Because here's what I know. If you claim to have not known that it, you were just shocked, one of two things had to have happened. Either you were paying absolutely no attention to that big old gas gauge right there on your dashboard, maybe even a light that was blinking at you, or there's something wrong with your gas gauge. Now, believe it or not, that actually happened to me. I remember it was the very first car I ever owned. I got it way back in high school, and I drove that same car all the way through college. And it was this one weekend I was driving home from school, coming back to my parents' house, and I'm driving down the highway, and all of a sudden the car just stopped right in the middle. I mean, it just died. And so I couldn't figure out what was wrong with it because uh, I, I actually knew, I could see the gas gauge said I had a quarter of a tank left gas. So I get a mechanic out there. He starts looking it over. He's checking everything out, and he can't find anything wrong. And finally, he says to me, he says, you know, the car's acting like it doesn't have gas in it. I said, oh, that's not possible. The gas gauge says I have a quarter of a tank left. And he says, well, let's try it. So we head down to a gas station. We pick up a gallon of gas and put it in the car. And sure enough, cranked up, worked fine. It was out of gas the whole time, and I had no idea. But from that day on, I had learned something. I only had a limit of a quarter of a tank on my gas gauge. I knew from that point on, I cannot let that gas gauge go below a quarter of a tank because that is my new limit. Now, let's be honest. When people run out of gas like that, it's usually because they know that their, their gas gauge is below the E and, and, and they have this conversation with themselves. And, and my guess is you may have had this conversation with yourself before. You see the gas gauge, you see it getting low, you maybe even see the light come on on your dashboard and you say this to yourself. You say, oh, I can make it. I got plenty, I got plenty of gas. I know exactly where I'm going. I know how far to get, to get there and, and I've got plenty of gas. And you do until you don't. See, I'm not here to talk to you, as you can probably guess, about running out of gas in your car. Here's the question I want you to consider. Have you ever run out of gas? Has your tank ever run on empty? Your emotional tank, your, your physical, your spiritual, your, your relational tank, has it ever gotten below the E? You ever had one of those moments where you just felt like you hit the wall? Like you were going along and, and you, you were trying and, and moving forward and, and you just kept pushing and kept pushing and, and, and you just finally came to a place where you just couldn't give any more. You just ran out of gas. You just, maybe, maybe you thought that if I just keep going, things will change, things will get better. I, I, I'm worn down, I'm tired now, but if I can just keep it up, things will change. And they don't change. And you ran out of gas. And when you did, when you hit that wall, relationally, emotionally, physically, whatever it might have been, my guess is you also experienced some disappointment. Mainly, you were disappointed with yourself. And that's what this series has been about so far. And we've been talking about this for the past few weeks. We've been asking the question, how do you deal with the disappointments that inevitably come into your life? And one of the key things that we've learned so far is that there is something that always will, will come to you before the disappointments. There's always something that, that leads you toward disappointment in life. And that one thing is expectations. And it could be any kind of expectations. It could be expectations that you placed on yourself, expectations that you placed on other people. Uh, even, as we said last week, maybe expectations that you've placed on God. And we're actually going to talk about that coming up. But this week, what I want to talk to you about is the expectations that often wind up running your personal gas tank, your emotional, your physical, your spiritual gas tanks down to empty. And, and, and what, what normally does that is the expectations that I let people place on me. Because here's my guess. My guess is if you've ever felt like you were running on empty, you had that feeling of disappointment with yourself that you weren't able to keep going. And if you felt that way, most likely you looked over your shoulder or you, took a, you sort of assessed the situation. And what really wound up driving you to that point of running out of gas 
was probably an expectation that you let someone else place on your life, and that's what led you there. Some of you have been running yourselves dry, and you're just trying to keep up with another person's expectations, and you've been doing that for almost your whole life. For example, maybe you had a mom, and for her, academics were very important. In fact, straight A's were expected. And every time you came home from school and you brought home a report card, it was just expected by her that you were going to have a straight-A report card. And so you worked and you studied and you stressed just to meet that expectation because you knew if you didn't meet it, there was going to be some disappointment. Or maybe you had a dad who, who wanted the best for you when it came to athletics. And, and so he put you on all the best teams with all the best coaches, and every weekend you were in the best leagues. And he was there at every game, at every practice, and he was watching and he was yelling, but he wasn't yelling words of approval and encouragement. He was pointing out all your mistakes. And over time, you just started feeling like, well, mainly a big disappointment. Or maybe you had a family member or even a teacher along the way who, who at some point, maybe even before you got out of high school, they had decided exactly how you were wired up and what your best course of action was for your career and the kind of life you ought to live. And, and, and so they had mapped out your whole future because they knew this is what you ought to do with your life. And so it felt like for you, the only way I can make this person that I really care about happy is to choose the career that they've told me I ought to choose. And you did that. And now it's making you miserable. Or maybe you're a stay-at-home mom, and every day your husband comes home and he's expecting a spotless house and well-behaved kids and a home-cooked meal sitting on the table, and you're thinking to yourself, the house is still standing and the kids are still alive. <laughs> you ought to be happy. Don't be disappointed. <laughs> you ought to be thankful. Or maybe you have a boss, and, and he's a workaholic. He works at least 12 hour days every single day he works nights he works weekends and he expects you or she expects you to do the exact same thing and you just can't and anytime you have to prioritize your family or something else over your job every time you walk out the door you feel that look or you hear that tone of voice and you sense the disappointment or maybe you have a friend and, and they have some high expectations for your friendship they feel as if they need you to, to be there for them a lot. And they expect you to, to hear all their problems and take care of all of their junk and them to dump it all on you. And, and they expect you to spend more time with them than anybody else. And they get jealous if you spend more time with other friends. And it's just a, it's a big, it's a bar of expectation that you just can't seem to jump over. Whatever the expectations are that you feel other people put on you, you get into this place where a lot of us just feel like you, you kind of have to say yes. You, you get in the place where you feel like I, I can't say no. And so what you do is you just keep saying yes until finally you, you hit the wall. You run out of gas and you just realize I can't do this anymore. And every time that happens, here's what, ha here's what winds up coming into the relationship. Frustration and bitterness. And not just from you. I mean, it's, it's all the way around. I mean, it's for the person who had the expectations. Everybody's frustrated. You're frustrated. You're bitter for, because you let them push you. You're frustrated and, and you're upset at yourself for letting it happen. And the other person's frustrated because you didn't live up to their expectations. So everybody's frustrated and everybody loses. And here's the part that a lot of us don't even think about. I just remind you of this if you haven't never thought about it this way, but... Anytime you allow someone's expectations to, to, to take that much of a precedence in your life, you realize that at some point you're not living your life anymore. You're living their life or their expectations for you. Because, see, here's, here's the deal. Your life consists of your time, your resources, your relationships. And if you've given all of that to another person or you've at least given an unbalanced amount to another person, you have basically given them your life. And like I said before, when you let that happen, in the end, it's only going to lead to frustration and disappointment for everybody involved. But here's the thing. And I think we all know this. I, I just, I just want to remind you of this. And you probably heard someone say this to you before, but hear it again. You don't have to say yes all the time. 
When somebody offers you an opportunity, when somebody gives you an invitation to, to something, when, you, when somebody says you should or you shouldn't, you can say no. And the truth is, you should say no in certain circumstances whenever an expectation is placed on you. Now listen, am I saying that that's an excuse for us to be lazy or immoral or not compassionate for people or to, to be selfish or even rebellious against someone who's in authority? No, that's not it. That, that's a whole other topic for a whole other day. And I think most of us are wise enough to know the difference in these situations. But in a lot of circumstances, in some circumstances, it is okay to say no to people's expectations. Because, and, and listen, there, there are those of you who are sitting here right now today listening to me in this room, and, and you know who you are. And if you're honest with yourself, you would say, you know what, more times than not in my life, I just feel compelled to say yes to everybody's expectations. And you're letting it Run your life, and you're running out of gas. <laughs> your tank is getting empty because of it. Some of you have done this more than once in your life. You, you, you go through, it's, it's basically a cycle. You, you say yes to everything because you don't want to disappoint people. You hit the wall, you run out of gas, you crash, you disappoint yourself, you disappoint everybody, and then when you recover from that, you start it all over again. You say yes, and you say yes, and you hit the wall again, and it just starts over, and you're in this cycle. And I'm here to tell you, you can say no. And you want to know where I get the authority to tell you that you can say no? I have it on very good authority. I get it from Jesus. Because, see, Jesus didn't always say yes. Jesus said no to a lot of things, to a lot of people. Anytime people tried to force their agenda on Jesus or to force their timeline or their purposes or their priorities or their plans onto the life of Jesus, many times Jesus said no to that. And if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, can I just remind you that one of the things that you believe is that Jesus is God in the flesh. You believe that, that Jesus is, is, is God and that he is right about everything. And that reason alone is a good enough reason for you to imitate him in this and for you to look to his life as an example for you to live your own life and to follow his example. But even if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus and you're not convinced that he's God in the flesh, that's okay. My advice to you is, is you can still follow Jesus. Some of you are like, wait a minute, what is that? Is that real? Did he, did he say what I just think he said? Because here's, here's what I know about you. Even if you don't follow Jesus as God's son, you at least probably believe that he's a good moral teacher. And, and here's the great thing about that. You can follow his teachings. Jesus had people follow him before they believed in him all the time. In fact, that's how all the original followers of Jesus started out. They didn't know exactly who he was. They weren't convinced of the whole God part, but they saw his life and they began to imitate him and they began to follow him. And as they did, they were convinced of who he was. So my advice to you is, that, is if you follow Jesus, even if you're not sure of, of his identity, he'll make, he'll make your life better and he'll make you better at life. And eventually you follow him long enough and it's just my belief that you'll come to figure out the whole God part. You can start to imitate him right now. Now, maybe you're here and you're not convinced of everything that I've said so far. And you're not so convinced that that was, the mode of, uh, that was the way Jesus lived, that he said no to people. So I want to give you a few examples and just walk through these with you just to show you uh, how Jesus went about living his life. And all of these are taken out of what we call the Gospels. These are the first four books of the New Testament. They're just eyewitness accounts about, from the people who lived it, who were there with Jesus, about the life of Jesus. They're biographies written by those folks uh, of the people who were there. Now, the first one, this the example I want to give you, is from Mark chapter 10. And in this encounter, Jesus is going to say no to some of his best friends. Let's look at it together. It says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the followers of Jesus, they came to Jesus and they say, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, isn't that a great way to ask for a favor? Jesus, we got a request, but before we ask the request, we want you to say yes before we tell you what the question is. They think Jesus is a dummy. And FYI, you should never say yes to anyone who asks you that question, okay? <laughs> you should always say what Jesus said, which was this. So what do you want me to do for you? He's like, guys, I I'm not going to say yes until you give me the question, okay? So why don't you give me the question and, and, and tell me what exactly it is you want. So they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Basically, they're saying, Jesus, we know you're, you're going to become a king at some point. You're going to have some great power and great authority. And we want to have almost as much power as you 
have power? And he says, well, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, well, you will drink the cup I drink and the baptize, you'll be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. And what's he talking about, about this cup and baptism? See, they didn't know what that meant. They're just, they're just agreeing. They're like, yeah, we'll do that. Whatever you say, Jesus, whatever that is. And they had no idea Jesus was actually talking about their death. <laughs> Jesus was saying, you're, you're going to wind up paying the price with your very life. And incidentally, virtually all the followers of Jesus did. They died for their faith. But he says, to sit at my right or to sit at my left, that's not for me to grant. These places belong for those for whom they've been prepared. Jesus says to his closest friends and their requests, he says, no, I, I, I'm not going to do that. I, I'm, I can't do that for you. And I want you to notice something about how Jesus responded to his friends. It gives us no indication that Jesus is worried about his friends' feelings that he's, uh, he's concerned that he might make them mad or he might lose their relationship. He doesn't make excuses. He doesn't try to lie his way out of it. Jesus says, look, I, I, I can't say yes to that request. And so he says no. And he doesn't meet their expectations. Did you also know that Jesus said no to peer pressure and to his own emotions? I'll show you. Look at John chapter 6. It says, after the people saw the sign that Jesus performed, evidently Jesus had just performed a miracle, they began to say, well, surely this is the prophet who was to come into the world. And then Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Now, let me just say, if someone decided they wanted to make me king and they came and they offered me that as an option, I have to admit, I'd probably have to go home and think about it, or at least consider, because, I mean, the life of a king is a pretty sweet life, you know. But Jesus, he didn't have to think about it. Jesus doesn't say to all these guys, well, that's, a pre, uh, that's a good offer, that's a pretty good offer, and, and I appreciate you thinking of me. Uh, let me go home, let me pray about this, and see if this is what I really want to do. No, Jesus doesn't do any of that. He, he just walks away. I mean, he literally just walks out, he leaves. And I'm sure it was tempting. I'm sure it was an emotionally charged moment, but he knew immediately, that's not part of the plan. That's not why I'm here. That does not fit my goals or my timeline. Did you know that Jesus said no also to solving other people's problems? Look at Luke 12. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? And then he says to him, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life doesn't consist of the abundance of your possessions. Now, let me point out something about this encounter. This is not a hard question for Jesus. In fact, if you just take it at face value of what the guy offers to Jesus the question, it's pretty easy. I mean, I mean in their culture, I mean, it was very customary for uh, when a parent dies for the brothers to, to divide the inheritance among them. And obviously that's not happening. So this guy says to Jesus, Jesus, this is only fair. And obviously his brother was holding out on him. Maybe he was being dishonest. Tell him to, to do what's right. And, and Jesus doesn't get involved. Jesus says, no, I'm not going to, I don't feel obliged to do that for you. And he, and he just steps out of the way. And it's a simple question. He could easily just said, yeah, you're right. That's what ought to happen. But he doesn't do that. Notice, Jesus is smart enough to make this decision, but he's wise enough to stay out of it. I'm going to say that again because that, that's like the sentence some of you guys need to take home with you. He is smart enough to make the decision, but he's wise enough to stay out of it because it's not his place. And now let me tell you another one that I think is going to hit home for a lot of us and maybe even shock some of you. Jesus said no a lot of times to helping people. Look at Mark chapter 1. It says, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew, all followers of Jesus. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, he took her hand, and he helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Now, a lot of people have said that this might very well be the greatest miracle ever recorded in the Bible. Simon actually asked Jesus to heal his mother-in-law. For those of you who didn't get that, that was kind of a joke, but all right, probably a bad one, but we'll move on. That evening, after he's done this great miracle, after sunset, the people began to bring to Jesus all these sick people and demon-possessed people. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. 
It gets very early in the morning while it's still dark. Jesus just gets up. He leaves the house. He went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions, they go looking for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everybody's looking for you. So here's the scene. At some point, all these people are coming to be healed by Jesus. And it's getting early into the morning, all throughout the night. And at some point, Jesus just gets up and he leaves. And he doesn't even tell anybody where he's going. Apparently, there are sick people still waiting to get to Jesus. And the disciples are like, where did he go? And so they go out looking for him. And when they find him, they're thinking, they say, Jesus, where, where'd you go? Why'd you leave? Everybody's here. They're looking for you. And instead of Jesus saying to his disciples, oh, guys, I'm sorry. I just, I got tired. And I, okay, okay, you're right. I'll come back and I'll finish helping all these people. Jesus replies, let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also because that." It's why I have come. You mean Jesus left people in a town unhelped and unhealed? Yes, he sure did. And that is a lesson that I think we need to learn from Jesus. And it's this. There is a limit to how much you and I are able to do to help other people. And it is not wrong at some point for us to step away when we have done all that we can do. Because there comes a time and there comes a place where you just have to take care of yourself. I've heard it said this way, you cannot give to others what you don't, do not have yourself. And that, that is so true. You have limits. I have limits. And even Jesus had limits. Wait a minute. Did he just say what I think he said? He said, Jesus had limits. And, and I know that doesn't sound right. And I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute. Didn't you just say that Jesus was God? And, and now you're saying that Jesus has limits. That doesn't make sense. Well, you're right. Jesus is God. He is God in the flesh. And let me tell you what that means. It means that God, who is unlimited in power, unlimited in resources, unlimited in, in, his, in, in anything. God lacks for nothing. He chose to limit himself by taking on the form of a limited human being. And so when Jesus came into the world as a human, Jesus experienced the same kind of limitations as a human being as you and I experience. He experienced physical limitations just like you and me. He got tired. He couldn't be in more than one place at one time. He physically could not do everything. And so because of that, Jesus had to steward his time, steward his energy, steward his compassion. Now, that's not a word we often use a lot in our culture. Do you know what the word steward means? It just means this. It means that I have a limited amount of something. And because it's limited, I have to figure out how to be wise in the way that I use it or the way that I uh, distribute whatever it is that I have, like stewarding your money. It's a limited amount of it, and therefore I have to manage it wisely because I don't want to run out. That's, what, that's all the word steward means. So you have something that's limited. You have time. You have energy. You have, you have resources. Jesus is in the same situation. Jesus has limited time. He has a limited amount of physical energy. He has a limited amount of emotional energy. And so he decides, instead of spending all of it on helping these people who obviously need help, he decides to take his time and his energy, and he believes it is better served in that moment by himself alone in prayer. And then he decides to take his limited time and energy and move on to somewhere else. And nowhere in this account do we ever get the idea that Jesus is feeling guilty about any of these decisions. So here's what we can conclude, and this is what you can know about you and your life. It is not unchristlike for you to say no to other people's expectations, even if, even if it means that not everybody is going to get the help that they need from you. Now, I suspect that I didn't need to convince a lot of you of this. It may just be something you needed to be reminded of. But you're still struggling because you're not sure how to do it. You're not sure when to say no. You're not sure how to go about it and doing it in the right way. And I get that. I, I feel that myself. So let me give you just three thoughts. Three real, Really, I want to give you three questions that you can wrestle with and ask yourself to try and figure this out. And I think it will help you a lot. Here's the first question. 
Who are you? And I know that sounds ridiculously simple, but here's what I mean by that. In other words, our opinion of ourselves, your opinion of yourself, a lot of times, almost always, informs how we respond to other people's expectations. How I view myself informs how I respond to the expectations that people put on my life. And a lot of times, the reason that we wind up not being able to say no is because we get swayed by other people, because we allow other people's opinions to determine what we think of ourselves. And that's what informs the way we decide yes or no on all these situations. And you know, at the moment that Jesus was baptized, the eyewitnesses who were there, who saw Jesus come up out of the water, they said that there was a voice from heaven, from God, and he said this. He said, this is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. And I believe that it was that statement that carried Jesus through his entire life, that informed his identity, that informed what he did and the decisions that he made. Jesus knew who he was. He knew that he was perfectly loved by God. And that gave him what he needed to make the decisions of who to say yes to and who to say no to. And here's the truth. So are you. You are perfectly loved by God. And there's no amount of love or no amount of attention or no amount of approval from any other person in your life that's ever going to be greater than that truth right there. You don't need to prove anything to anyone else. You don't need to earn anything from anyone else. And when you know that, when you know exactly who you are, the expectations of other people get put in a whole new light. They get put in their place. And you're in a much better position to say yes or to say no. Second question, who's your audience? Who's your audience? In other words, who are you trying to please? Are you trying to please people? Good luck with that because that's a moving target and it always will be. You'll never be able to please everybody. Or are you trying to please God? I love the way one of the writers of the Bible says it like this. He says, For we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. And our purpose is to please God, not people, because He alone examines the motives of our hearts. See, I, I can just imagine all throughout Jesus' life, all throughout Jesus' ministry, that he could just, it, all, the, all those times when the words of his heavenly Father were just ringing in his ears, you're my son, and with you I am well pleased. And Jesus would think, if the Father is pleased, then that's all that matters. And here's what's so great about answering that question and, and getting this right. Pleasing God will always lead you to love and to serve other people. Because here's what we know. We know that love for God is best demonstrated by love for people. So when you start to live for an audience of one, when you start to live as someone who seeks to please God rather than please people, then you become someone who can love better, who can serve better, who can, who can help better with all the expectations in your world, with all the other people in your life. But here's the great thing. You'll be able to do that. You'll be able to love and to lead and to serve in a way that doesn't destroy you in the process. That's the key. So when you're faced with an expectation, just ask yourself, who's my audience? Is it God or is it another person? Is that who I'm trying to please? And then the third and final question is, who's filling up your life? What's your source of energy? Where's your source of life, your source of strength? Where does all of that come from? I'll tell you where Jesus found it. Jesus went and he prayed on a mountain while people down below needed help. And, he, and, and the reason he did that is because Jesus knew that his source of life, his source of peace, his source of energy, and his approval was not down there with those people. All of that he was finding in his relationship with his father. See, it's so easy for us to fill up our tanks, to fill up our emotions, our physical bodies, all of the things that we need with the approval and the encouragement of other people. But the problem with that is, and I get how that feels because getting awarded, getting encouraged, getting applauded by other people feels really good. And it does fill you up, but it is a very temporary feeling. It doesn't last. It's a very earthly kind of filling up. But there is an approval and there is a filling up that is more sustainable, that will keep you going for the long haul. You need to be filled with God. 
You need to get that source from your heavenly Father. That's why Jesus didn't see it like a waste of time when he would go up on that mountain and he would spend time praying to his Father. It wasn't a waste of his time. It was his source of life because his Father was the one filling him up. So who's filling up you? You know, where, Where's your source? Where, where, where are you getting the energy? Where are you getting the approval? Where are you getting the encouragement to do your life? Are you getting that from people? Or is it coming from your Father in heaven? So that's a challenge. When, when you feel like your tank is running on empty, when you feel like the expectations of other people are starting to pull you toward things or pull you toward places or pull you toward making decisions that you shouldn't make or places you shouldn't go, ask those three questions. Who are you, really? Who's your audience? Who's, who am I trying to please here? Is it God? Is it people? And in the end, who's filling my life with the source of energy and life that I truly need to sustain me for the long haul? And I'm telling you, you get those three questions squared away, I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. Let's bow our heads and I'll pray for us. Father, I have no doubt that because of the kind of world we live in today, the kind of schedules we wind up keeping, there are a lot of us walking in here today, and we came into this room, and we're, our tanks are just empty. We're running empty emotionally, spiritually, even physically. And we just keep letting the expectations of other people get piled on to us. So, God, we admit we don't get this right very often, and we just can't do this alone. Father, would you help us to learn from Jesus how to live this part of our lives? Help us to know and remember exactly who we are, that we are perfectly known and perfectly loved by you. Help us to live for an audience of one, to be God-pleasers, not just people-pleasers. And finally, God, give us the wisdom to know when we need to unplug from those things that are draining our lives and to plug into a source that will give us life. And that is our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.